Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today, are we getting enthusiastic about questions? <laughs> you bet. But first, our most recent bonus episode was a tour through the world of child language acquisition research after Gretchen read 103 papers on different languages. You can go to patreon.com slash enthusiasm for this and many more bonus episodes. Our thanks also to everyone who joined in celebrating Lingthusiasm's sixth anniversary in November by sharing a link to favorite episodes or your favorite Lingthusiasm fact or just sharing Lingthusiasm more generally. We've really enjoyed seeing and replying to your recommendation posts. Thank you for tagging us in them at Lingthusiasm on all social media networks. And also our thanks if you shared in private as well. We really appreciate it. and It helps every year. In further anniversary celebrations, we're conducting a listener survey for the first time. This is your chance to tell us about what you're enjoying in Lingthusiasm so far and what else we might want to be doing in the future. Including suggestions for topics. And maybe crossover episodes with other shows. Also, we couldn't resist the opportunity to add a few linguistic experiments in there as well, which we'll be sharing the results of next year. We even got ethics approval from La Trobe University so that we can write up the results maybe as a research paper one day. You can see links to the survey and the ethics information on the Lingthusiasm website in our show notes. The Lingthusiasm survey is open till December 15th, 2022, anywhere on earth. Go to bit.ly slash Lingthusiasm Survey 22, all one word, all lowercase, to see the links of the survey or to see what an official ethics approval for a fairly minor survey looks like. Or follow the links from our website and social media. Whether you've joined us recently or you've been with us the whole six years, thanks for helping us celebrate our anniversary. What is a question? Is this a question? Am I doing a question now? This is a question here, eh? Question? <laughs> question. We use questions to gather information from each other. That's why they're very handy in a conversation. And sometimes we also use questions for stylistic or rhetorical effect, since we didn't really answer any of those introductory questions. <laughs> That is true. But it's also good to note that questions can have a variety of different grammatical shapes and different patterns to how we articulate them. And one of the things that I think is really cool about questions is the way they cut across a bunch of different linguistic subfields. So mm. there are things about the words and the orders of the words and their relationships with each other when it comes to questions. There are also things about how you modulate your voice, the pitch of your voice to make a question. And then there are things about how questions fit into social situations. So it really lets us talk about a whole bunch of different areas in linguistics under one simple uh, question. <laughs> Let's start with the tone of voice that we use to ask a question. So this is question where your voice goes up at the end to indicate that you're asking a question. Right. So this is sometimes called question intonation. This is the way the intonation or the pitch of your voice changes uh, to make something into a question. And it's fairly common, at least in the languages that I've studied to any degree, to be like, yeah, well, you know, here are some various grammatical strategies to make questions. Or you can just use question intonation, i.e. making the pitch of your voice rise towards the end of the sentence. And this is a common strategy across languages, but isn't universally required. Well, and actually doing a rising intonation at the end of a sentence to indicate a question isn't even always an indicator of a question in English. No, when I asked, what is a question? I didn't have to use rising intonation because we had that question word what there. It was very clear that it was acting as a question and I didn't need that rising intonation. And in fact, if you had, what is a question? It would almost have sounded like you didn't know whether you wanted to be asking that question. It adds that uncertainty to it. Right, which is a thing that rising intonation can also do in English. You know, if I say something like, it's raining out, it might be asking, but I might also just be indicating uncertainty about whether or not it's raining. So questions in English where the structure of the words and how they're put together already indicates that it's a question are actually the ones that often don't use that rising intonation for a question. And it's individual words or phrases that otherwise you couldn't tell that they're a question. That's when this rising intonation shows up the most. There's also my favorite type of question intonation, which is the British downstep, which sounds like an old fashioned dance. Actually, now I say it out loud. 
<laughs> oh, I love this one. I think this is the one that I pick up on whenever I'm talking to British speaking folks, because it just feels very contagious to me. Would you like to give an example? <laughs> Would you like to give an example? Ah, there you are. Yeah, that's sort of the, would you like a cup of tea? Yeah, I find myself very compelled by it as well. It is much more of a British form of intonation than North American. We don't really have it in Australia either. But whenever I hang around British people that do have this, I feel really compelled by it and I find myself using it very easily. Yeah, this is the one that's got sort of on the final word, there's sort of a relatively sharp fall and this little rise. It's a little bit hard to hear on T because that's just one syllable. But if you say something with two syllables, would you like a cup of coffee? Then you have the coffee going down and then up again. And you can get this nice little shape, which is really fun. Would you like a banana? <laughs> would you like an apple? <laughs> it's great. I saw this really interesting post about Meghan Markle picking it up as a feature of her increasingly British-influenced accent. That made me feel really reassured that it's not just me. And the fact that you also find it really compelling as well. <laughs> I think, you know, to be honest, when I first met you, I didn't know whether Australians did this intonation or not. So oh. I may have just been doing it around you just to be extra careful, uh, extra polite. Oh, and because it's a very satisfying intonation contour. But intonation is only helpful for making clear if something's a question or not in spoken language. And we use a lot of written language as well. Yeah. So the, you know, classic indicator of this rising intonation, this higher pitch at the end is the question mark. So if I'm writing down, you know, to remind myself, tea, coffee, I could put a question mark after each of those. But because of how the question mark indicates that rising intonation, sometimes it's also used to indicate this upwards pitch at the end of the sentence, even when the effect of a question isn't intended. Mm -hmm. And then the inverse, when you're asking a question and you mean it sort of rhetorically or ironically, sometimes people, especially in more internet influenced styles of English, don't write the question at all. And that's sort of a, a drier question or a non-question that has the form of a question because you can often tell it from the order of the words or other things about the wording. Oh, I like this as a diagnostic for the fact that we have things that are grammatically questions, but there are a variety of different reasons that we use question structures, and not all of them are for, I want some information from you. Right. So there's about five different ways that some people talk about the form of a question. So exactly, you have this asking for information. What time is it? Do you have a pen? Mm -hmm. And people often use a question mark there. There's also requesting action. Okay. So saying something like, could you give me that? And that's sort of a polite question. A question that has the effect of, of politeness. Or would you give me a pen? This is, again, requesting a particular action. I never really thought about the fact that both of those are asking, but they're asking very different types of things, information and asking someone to do something. Yeah, actually, in Spanish, there's two different verbs that are used to convey these different types of asks. Oh. So asking information is preguntar. Mm -hmm. Me pregunto qué hora fue. He asked me what time it was. And this is the asking for information. But to request an action of someone is pedir. Okay. Mi pidió escribir una carta. He asked me to write a letter. And that's, you know, ask someone to do something rather than ask someone about something. I love when you find a structure in a language that makes something clear that has a different function to two things that just get lumped together for English. That's really cool. Yeah, it's really great. And then the other three kinds of questions aren't really about asking at all. And I feel like tend to grow less and less likely to use question marks when it comes to the written versions, because mm. the intonation is also doing very different things. So we have rhetorical questions. What can you expect? You know, how could anyone possibly have known? And sometimes these are written with a question mark still. I think increasingly in internetish styles, they're often not written with a question mark, as I discuss in my book, Because Internet. Uh, <laughs> And then the other two that I think are really interesting, which I would really not write with a question mark, are confirmation of known information. So if I say, did you see that? Hmm, I think I'd put a punctuation mark like an exclamation mark rather than a question. Right, exactly. So I can say, did you see that? And then that's asking about information. But if I say, did you see that? With sort of two down steps there. I think I'd write it with an exclamation mark, and then it's more about the confirmation. Hmm. And then also there is the intensification use, something like, what a big dog. Would you look at that sunset? Huh. Yeah, I mean, they have the structure of a question, and I don't even think of those as questions. 
Right. Like, I'm not saying, would you look at this sunset for me and, you know, tell me why it's green? Yeah. Okay. I can That's do that. That's sure. a, you know, requesting of action. <laughs> would you look at this cup for me and tell me if you think it's broken? Um, like, those are real <laughs> questions that are asking for something. But would you look at that sunset? Again, it's got this sort of choppier intonation. And I think I would, again, have to write that with an exclamation mark. So we have five different functions and only the ones that are soliciting information or requesting actions, we actually tend to think of as really being questions, even though they all have the structure of a question. Right. Sort of, you know, capital Q questiony questions compared to the sort of things that borrow from the world of questions and are actually accomplishing something else. Hmm. But let's talk about some of these sort of gold standard, you know, capital Q questiony questions. Sure. We can broadly divide questions into two different types, and they tend to have different structures because they're doing different things. And the first type are questions where we're just soliciting like a yes, no, or a binary or a polar question choice. Is, is not, you know, do, do not, do or do not, there is no try. Uh, <laughs> So sometimes these get called polar questions. I think yes, no questions may be easier to, to keep track of from a talking out loud perspective. Do you like questions would be a great example. Yes, I do. No, I do not. So this solicits an answer that is either yes or no. English is kind of weird about these because we've got mm. this do there. I think like just as a spoiler, English is weird about questions in general. We're going to see this with all the question structures. I have questions about English and questions. I have so many questions about English. A more typical language for yes, no questions might be doing something more like Italian, where you have, you know, here's the statement that you're saying, but you've put a question mark after it. So something like, stai bene, uh, which is literally like, you are good, but you've made it a question. And I can either answer si, yes, or no, no. Or something like, parlano italiano. They speak Italian? Si. No. No. And, you know, here the they or the you there is not said aloud because Italian doesn't need them. But that's not the part that makes them more typical as a question. It's just, here's the statement that you're making, um, and you can make it into a question. They are not adding a word like do or moving a word like, are you good? Uh, are you okay? They're not doing any of that stuff. It's just, you can just say it, but say it with the question intonation. It's fine. So if I see a group of people and I say... Parlano Italiano, do they speak Italian? And then they all start speaking Italian. I can say, Parlano Italiano. And I don't have to change anything about the order of those words for it to be, ah, uh, yes, a statement. They do speak Italian. And you can do this in English to make yes, no questions. You can say something like, you good? Yeah, you're good. Or they speak Italian? They speak Italian. And you can do this in intonation with English, but it's not as much of the default strategy. The default strategy is like, You've got to do other stuff with do and moving words around. Definitely much more informal to do that kind of question structure. And it sort of implies in English that you expect the answer to be yes. If you say something like, they speak Italian, they speak Italian. Oh, yeah, I never thought about that, but I feel like that makes sense. Whereas if you say, do they speak Italian, you're sort of more open for the answer to be yes or no. And I think that intonation has a more neutral connotation in languages where that's the default strategy. It's not the only way to do yes, no questions by any stretch of the imagination. I find it very convenient that Mandarin Chinese uses two other really common strategies that we can talk about. One of them being just a particle that says, hey, I'm doing a question right now. Right. So Mandarin's got this great word, ma, which just means this is a question now. So you can add it to something like ni hao, which is you good, literally, and you get ni hao ma. And the ma there means like you good question. Are you good? Are you okay? How are you effectively? But it's just adding, this is a question now. It's very elegant. It's very straightforward. You can add it to lots of different kinds of sentences and just get, this is now the yes, no version of this question. And I think there are quite a lot of languages that have some sort of question particle that's like, yep, now this is a question. Yeah, very common to have one either at the beginning or the end of a sentence, particularly. They're good spots to put your question particles. Mandarin also has this other construction where you put the yes part and the no part in the question together. So you have the yes version of a verb and the no version of a verb together. So something like, do you want tea? The do you want part would be yao bu yao. So that's literally something like want, not want? Yeah. And so someone says, do you want or not want tea as the default question structure? And then you say yao or bu yao 
I want or I don't want. Right. And again, this is sort of making explicit, you know, a, a yes, no question is giving you a choice between two options, you know, do you want this or not? But in English, if you want to say, like, do you want this or not, you still have to have that do there. And it's right there. And in the world's languages, that is a very uncommon structure. We'll post the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures map, of which you see English as a little dot that's a very different color to most of the other things around it, because it has a very unusual question structure. So historically in English, it was a little bit more straightforward in that you just put the verb at the beginning of the sentence. So if you say something like, have you the time? Mm -hmm. Where in present day English, you'd have to say something like, do you have the time? But in sort of Shakespeare, which is early modern English and earlier, and still in languages like German, you can say something like, have you the time? Or, you know, watch you the video or see you this fish, or something like that. Watch you the video being a classic line from Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare was so big into watching videos. <laughs> Watch you this play. <laughs> and then what happened in English is that we kept the ability to put the verb at the beginning of the sentence only for auxiliary verbs. So you can say, are you watching the video? Can you watch the mm -hmm. video? You know, might you watch the video? Have you seen the video? But you don't have the ability to just say, see you the video or watch you the video anymore. And that's where the do comes in because do is sort of this lightweight thing that you can just put in if you've got to move something to the front of the sentence, but your verb is too heavy. Thank you, do. <laughs> so yeah, so English has sort of ended up down this interesting historical pathway. But that means that when you go to learn another language from English, you're always saying, all right, well, I'm like really, really confident it's not going to do the do thing that English does for like arcane historical reasons. It's going to do something mm -hmm. else, a more normal thing like intonation or having a question particle. And this is also true for our other main type of questions. Our first type of question was, do you have the time? Yes, no, kind of forced choice answer. Our second type of question asks for a more open but particular piece of information, like what is the time or when are you coming over? So these questions use words like who, what, where, when, why, and how, which are often called WH words in English because most of them except for how begin with WH. And so linguists sometimes refer to these questions as WH questions for that reason, which is super a piece of terminology that doesn't really hold up across other languages, but it's easy to remember, so we're going to keep it for now. And for English questions like, what time is it? Where are we meeting? That WH word is always at the start of the question that you're asking. I feel like we're arranging like a secret assignment or something like that. You know, where are we going to be? Will you have the letter? And what time? Where? Who's going to meet us? Oh, I thought we were just catching up for coffee and cake. <laughs> you have a much more uh, sinister-minded motive behind all these questions than I do. <laughs> I like to think of my cake assignations as very important, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we're putting all those WH words at the start, regardless of the nature of the appointment that we're keeping. <laughs> And in principle, right, these WH words are, are at the beginning in questions in English, you know, who's going to be there, or what time. But also the answers to all of those have the answer towards the end of the sentence. So mm -hmm. you are where? You're at the cafe. Let's meet when? Let's meet at two o'clock. You're meeting who? We're meeting our friends, the secret agents, obviously. <laughs> Just for a fun little secret agent tea and cake. Which is a possible but not the typical way of asking these questions as well. And really just shows that the information doesn't always have to be at the start, even though we tend to put it at the start for a question structure. And like a lot of European languages like to do this thing where those WH words, which don't begin with WH in most of these other languages, <laughs> go to the beginning of the sentence. But not all the Indo-European languages, because the Indic languages, so Hindi, I think Nepali as well, probably a lot of languages in that area, don't allow you to move those WH words to the beginning of the sentence. That's right. In Nepali, the WH words are K words. If we'd started with Nepali grammarians doing the world's linguistic diversity, we'd be talking about K words. You know, to be honest, like in Indo-European in general, a lot of these words begin with a K sound or like a QU or a, a C. This would be a lot more typologically valid, at least for one language family. It's just <laughs> very English centric that we're talking about WH words instead of like KW words, which is the more, at least for, for one very large language family, accurate way of talking about them. So in Nepali, if you say, Ami kaha bechong, that kaha is where, 
how many cafe bechong we meet at the cafe and you don't change the word order at all which again is a lot more of a simple solution than english's moving of it yeah i had to interestingly sort of unlearn this in french because in school in french you learn oh yeah you know you move all those wh words the qu words to the beginning of the sentence um which is still the sort of formal French way to do it. But in conversation, most mm-hmm. of the time, people don't actually move them. And you sound more natural if you don't move them. So there are some languages where it's sort of optional, like French. There's some languages where you really do move them almost all the time, like in English. And then there are some languages where really nobody ever moves them at all. And that's more like Nepali. I like the slight outrage that comes with English if you don't move it. Like, you are where? <laughs> like, I am, I'm outraged that you're not at the cafe where we're meant to be meeting. And that's similar to how in English, if you're asking yes, no questions, just with intonation, you like cake, it sounds sort of incredulous or like you expect a particular direction of the answer rather than being a default strategy that is more pragmatically unmarked or more pragmatically neutral. And once again, it's worth just pointing out that English has the less common way of doing questions in the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures. There are more than twice as many languages where moving The WH word to the front is not what's done. There are a lot of languages that do it, but not all, and by no stretch of the imagination. And also that sometimes we move for WH questions in English, both the do and the WH word. So if you're saying something like, why don't you come? You've got a do in there like we saw earlier, and you've got a WH word. And again, the do thing, that's just not what other languages do. It's like English was designed to keep syntax people really busy and happy. That's my, that's my theory. Speaking of things that keep syntacticians really happy, there's another thing you can do for questions. Okay. And this is maybe my favorite question thing because they're so versatile and they're fun and you can sort of do lots of things with them. They're a little more flexible. And these are tag questions. Oh, they sound fun. So this is when you have, you know, a main sentence, like a sort of a a normal sentence. And then you can add a little extra thing at the end to make it into a question that is sort of tacked on like a little little tag on a piece of clothing to make it more questiony. So the classic, very formal English example is saying something like, isn't it? So it's cold, isn't it? Tag questions are interesting, aren't they? Right. But there's more fun versions. So you can say like, it's cold out, right? Oh, yeah, it's doing the same thing with an even shorter tag. Yeah. And I think it's that little pause maybe before the tag question that distinguishes it from you just have a question word that's sort of the default way of asking a question, because it's cold out, right? Or it's cold out, isn't it? Again, sort of expects an answer in a particular direction Hmm. and has this little pause before it. One of my favorites from the Briticism department is the contraction of isn't it, which is in it. Ah, yes. So it's cold, isn't it? I'm probably not saying that as Britishly as people who actually have that Mm -hmm. in their native dialects do. I like that in it has just become so stable and contracted that you can use it in a variety of places where you'd have to have a different tag for something else. Like tag questions are interesting in it, which again, I am absolutely not the right kind of British English speaker to pull that off. (laughs) Whereas with the full tag, I needed to say aren't they and have the aren't match the plural of tag questions. In it has just become its own solid little tag by itself. Yeah, which is, again, the cool thing about tag is you can just keep putting stuff in tags because they're sort of more versatile and flexible. Like English is stuck with this weird do situation for complicated historic reasons, but you can just keep innovating and make in it. And it's really fun. Another fun tag question is in Japanese. The tag question form is ne. Oh, that's definitely a thing I hear in Japanese TV shows. Yeah, and I've seen speculation online that the ne in Japanese is somehow related to Portuguese, which also has a tag question in ne, Mm -hmm. which comes from isn't it, like na e. Ah. But unfortunately, I looked up this etymology, and it seems like this is an accident, like this is just convergent evolution. Sometimes things resemble each other, and they're not actually related. So it would have been cool if it was, but it seems like it's not. And it's just one of those things where tag questions tend to be really short and reduced and get shorter as people use them more and more. So perhaps unsurprising you get them with the same shape across different languages. Yeah, exactly. And I think I need to say my favorite tag question as a Canadian is obviously A, Canadian A. 
Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Which is a very short and reduced form. Obviously, it's just one vowel. And the cool thing about A is that it's a bit different from how other tag questions are used in English. Mm -hmm. Because other tag questions in English, you can't put them on sentences that are already questions. Okay. So if you say something like, did you see the game last night? Did you? <laughs> you sound very insistent, but it definitely <laughs> doesn't you? feel like a tag question. <laughs> right. Or what are you trying to say? Are you? Okay, that definitely does not work. <laughs> that just crashes. Yeah. Or using right for your tag question. Did you see the game last night? Right? Okay, that works as a tag question in the examples we had before and not there because it's a question already. But A can be added to both yes-no questions and WH questions, and it's still okay. Huh. So did you see the game last night, eh? This is fine for me. That sounds like a thing a Canadian would say. <laughs> I perhaps Thanks. don't have the best intuitions about this. Uh, or what are you trying to say, eh? This also sounds totally fine to my Canadian ears. So this is something that's sort of unique about A, that it can also be added as a tag question to another question, where most tag questions in English don't let you do that. Oh, it's very flexible. Isn't it great, eh? <laughs> the other cool thing about questions, as well as their intonation and their grammar, is how they get really interesting when we look at how they're used in the conversation context. Ah, you know, like my hobby. Which is? Well, it's interpreting the semantic structure of a question while ignoring the pragmatic context. Ah, can you give me an example of that? Yes. Okay, you've established <laughs> that you could give me an example of that. And I feel like by not volunteering the example when I asked that question and treating it as a yes-no question with no other request for information – uh, has really proven your point. Good job. <laughs> I really have ignored the pragmatic context, which is often people ask a yes or no question and they're looking for an answer that's longer than just yes or no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't come up with this. This is a meme that makes its way around the internet in various formats. I think it's really great, though. <laughs> a self-evidencing example is always a true delight. <laughs> Absolutely. This idea that oftentimes when we're asking what seems to be a yes or no question, we're actually expecting and often providing more information than that, mm -hmm. made me feel really validated in a thread on Twitter from the linguist Liz Stoko, who pointed out that when you actually look at questions in the wild, in use, in corpora, oftentimes people actually do answer a yes or no question with more than just yes or no in response. Because as we've just established, to not do so comes across really, really weird, <laughs> dry and unhelpful in the conversation. Right. So a few examples that she has from context. Do you have pets? I mean, my answer is no, but then I feel like I have to give you like the reason why we don't have pets based on various factors. So like even with a no, I already feel like I'm opening up more about that. And the answer in her corpus is yes, two cats, which I know you don't have two cats, but that's the kind of thing that people say when they do have pets. Yeah, I was going to read from your script and then I was like, <laughs> but then people will think I have two cats and I don't for like complicated reasons. It's not that I don't like pets. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, like as soon as someone says two cats, you go, oh, that's like, do they hang out together? Suddenly you have like an in to asking more questions. Exactly. Because people always love to talk about their pets. And the same thing with asking someone, do they have kids? People will often start talking about specifically their kids and their ages and these sorts of things, rather than just say yes or no in a very blunt sort of way. Yeah. If I call up and say, can I make an appointment at the hairdressers? They're not just going to say yes. And then like, that's it. They're going to be like, yes, when are you available? What would you like to have done? And especially when the answer is a little bit more dispreferred, if it's something that you feel a bit socially awkward about. Mm -hmm. So Stoko has this example with a salesperson, a client saying, and do you have internet access at all, Mr. Jones? And the client says, uh, yeah, the wife's got a laptop. And that really conveys some particular things about, you know, Mr. Jones and his relationship to the internet, mm -hmm. which is like, he's sort of online, but maybe not very online, rather than just, yes, technically, there's internet access in their household. Yeah, he doesn't seem to be really uh, looking for it there. And there's actually a really great example also from Stoko's Corpus about someone doing this very literal yes answer to yes no questions in a way that makes the other person prod for information. Okay, should we do a little radio play of it? Yeah, so this is in a cafe. You have a cafe customer, a cafe staff, and the customer says, do you have Wi-Fi? Yes, we do. Uh, can customers use it? Yes, they can. 
Uh, do I need a code or? Apparently, according to this, I point to the place on the wall where the code is. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so most of the time, I think when a customer says, do you have Wi-Fi? They're saying, and how do I get on it? Or what's the password? Yeah. Not just, yep. Okay. So, so I can use it. Okay. But like, how do I do that? That really strikes me as a staff member who is very sick of pointing to the sign. <laughs> yeah. And you see how immediately unhelpful that is. And I feel like this research and these observations are really helpful because I feel like there's a kind of teaching you how to do conversation that's like, ask open questions. These yes, no questions really trap people into locked answers. Yeah. And if we actually analyze what people are doing in conversation, it turns out that asking a yes, no question, people will often continue volunteering information or provide a springboard for doing that rather than saying to somebody, you know, do you have kids? And if so, how many and what are their ages? Mm -hmm. Saying, do you have kids will often lead people into volunteering how many and what their ages are and these sorts of additional onto the questions. And there's this post about using yes, no questions in like a psychotherapy context where you're trying to have people open up. Mm -hmm. But sometimes saying, you know, do you feel this particular way can be a way of someone talking about their feelings more or even asking a question like, can you tell me more? Which in its form looks like it's kind of a yes, no question. You know, can you tell me more? Yes. Now I'm going to stop talking. It probably actually has the effect of saying, you know, I'd like you to tell me more. Please tell me more but sometimes phrased in a more polite way. So getting really hung up on the difference between this sort of, oh, you have to ask questions with WH words in them because that's the only kind of open question doesn't actually seem to be how conversation is structured when you look what people are actually doing. In fact, the more important thing is just to think about who is likely to have information and who has the right to ask questions and who has the right to answer questions. This brings us to a really interesting thing that speakers of Yele Dine do which is a language spoken in Rossel Island of Papua New Guinea. And they don't use the structural things that we talked about to mark a question, whether that's a question word or changing the word order, but they use instead a deep understanding of the social context. And they don't use question intonation either. So that's all the strategies we've discussed so far, having ways of rearranging or adding words or using intonation to mark questions. So their questions really are identical to statements. But people can still tell if a question is being asked because of the informational mismatch between what you think the other person is likely to know. Right. So if you assume the person you're speaking to has a younger brother, but you're not sure, you want them to confirm it, you could say something like, you have a younger brother, to which they could reply, yes, I do, or no, I don't, because in context, you know that they are a higher authority about whether or not they have a younger brother than you are probably. Yeah. The you have pets would obviously come across as a question because I know who's in my household more than you do. Right. So if I talk about somebody's internal states, you know, you're hungry, that actually means, are you hungry? Because how could I know whether you're hungry or not? Except if you tell me. It reminds me a little bit of how questions get asked that use evidentials in Lamjung Yolmo and the other languages I've worked with, which is that you have to ask a question of someone and they have to answer with whether they know because they saw something or because they heard about it. And you ask the question by using the form of evidence you think they're most likely to have okay, based on their experience. So you have to keep track of whether this person has the likelihood of answering a question and what evidence they're going to use to answer the question with. So this is something like if you're saying – do you know if someone's still around or do you think they're still around or have you seen this person recently? Like whether they're likely to know. Whether they're likely to know because they saw the person or heard. Or a really good example is the difference between are you hungry or is she hungry? Where if I ask you if you're hungry, I'm going to use, do you have personal experience of the hunger? Whereas if I ask about someone else, is this other person hungry? Have you been told? Right, because I wouldn't be able to experience that directly. Yeah. This sounds like it might be sort of useful in talking especially about people in social situations. So I want to say, like, did they have a nice party? There's a difference between whether you think I was there at the party having direct experience of it being nice, mm -hmm. or whether I simply heard about it after it happened, and I think it went really well. Yeah. And it's not that we aren't aware of this in English as well. It's just that we're forced to make a grammatical choice in these languages with evidential systems that shows up this information asymmetry or access to information in a different way. Whereas in English, doing so is optional, like you can do it, but you don't have to. 
Yeah. And if I ask, did they have a nice party? And you say, oh, I didn't go, but someone else said it was great. I'd be like, oh, okay. I might have asked because I thought you'd been there. Right. So it sort of, yeah, embeds sort of what your assumptions are. I found the way that people do questions in conversation so interesting uh, that I spent a whole chapter of my thesis thinking about questions in the grammar and conversations of Lum Jung Yilmo. And I think it is because they bring together you know, the phonetics with the intonation patterns and the grammar with the word choices and the word order and unescapably the conversational context for how people make the choices of the types of questions they ask and the types of questions that they give. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get linguistics merch, including our new elegant redesign of the IPA on posters, mugs, and t-shirts at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and you wish there were more? You can get access to an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, plus our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now at patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Have you gotten really into linguistics and you wish you had more people to talk with about it? Patrons also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans. Plus, all patrons help keep the show ad-free. Recent bonus topics include doing child language research in more languages, an interview with Liz McCullough about how linguistics interacts with science communication, and a discussion of how we redesigned the layout of the International Phonetic Alphabet to make it look really cool and put it on lots of cool items that you can get as gifts or for yourself. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Dopierella, and our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!